Here with the legend, my man Marcus Stroman. How are you doing, Stro? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> hey, it's my pleasure. So you just came back from boxing, which is awesome. Yeah, man. Um, definitely something I'm newly incorporating, kind of in my routine, uh, just for balance and unwinding of the body. So had an emphasis on on boxing lefty to essentially unwind my body. I'm big on to having balance of my body from both sides. So essentially what the boxing does is I'm boxing, not my natural stance, I'm boxing lefty and I'm throwing most of my combos going this way to unwind myself from always going this way. So it's a, it's a big thing for my body. That's awesome. And hey, if someone charges a mound because of a case <laughs> or something, <laughs> you yeah. got him. I'll be ready. <laughs> yeah, you and AG, right? Facts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we were just talking. I mean, it, what, one thing that's cool is you grew up on Long Island. I grew up on Long Island. I mean, you were pretty much following in my footsteps. I know how it goes, right? <laughs> so what town did you grow up in? Medford. Yeah, man. Medford. Went to Patchogue, Medford. And yeah, Holbrook is 10, 15 minutes, man, right down the road. So that's super close. That's, that's awesome. Where did you like go to hang out? Like, I mean, I, I, I know that whole area real well, obviously. Uh We'd go to like Fire Island on the beach, uh, like spend some time over there, um, Main Street and Patchogue, Smith Haven Mall. Like, I mean, I've kind of kind of hit all the restaurants in Long Island, anywhere from kind of Suffolk County, the Ice Lips, the Bay Shores, the Hot Pog, like kind of all, all along that Main Street. Awesome. So is, is Smith Haven Mall still there? I believe so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I used back to go there too. Staying at my house, man. I always, I always get out there and just it brings back so many memories. That's so where did you did you play Little League growing up? Yeah. Um Ronkonkoma Cardinals. Um that I was played kind of, for Ronkonkoma too. Yeah. So Sachem. I played honestly for a lot of Sachem teams growing up. So which is more honestly Holbrook, the Holbrook area. So I was always associated for whatever reason. I always played for for a lot of those travel teams were more Sachem kids, honestly. Oh, that's that's really cool. Did your like so growing up, like did your dad I mean how did you get interested in baseball? Yeah, definitely my dad, man. I played baseball, basketball, soccer, football, um, all growing up. And then in high school, I did basketball, baseball, and football. And to be honest, man, baseball was something I always played, but it was always my third favorite sport. Um, I, I always enjoyed playing it, but I always enjoyed football and basketball more. And baseball is something that, honestly, I just kind of transitioned into as I got older. So why was it your third favorite sport? I don't know, man. I, I feel like basketball, I, basketball is always my favorite sport. Still like is like, I still have a love, like a secret love for basketball, man. Just cause um, just the excitement of basketball, the action, the fast pace of the game. I, I think I kind of honored that um, in, in, in basketball and baseball being kind of more slower, kind of took me a little bit more time to get acclimated to and to really fall in love with the game. So off the bat, I feel like I was more interested in baseball, football, because they're more, fast paced, more athletic type games. Um, and how, how much of that also was like, I mean, those sports are also known for just a little bit of trash talk. There's a whole, like baseball yeah. didn't yeah. have that. Yeah, definitely like that, that component of it too, man. I was a big trash talker on the basketball court in high school. And like you said, baseball, I feel like it's starting to come into the game a little bit, but it, it, it really is kind of like out of the feel or out of the element of baseball to, you're not going to be verbally talking to someone as you're delivering a pitch you know what i mean it kind of goes against the the unwritten rules <laughs> i mean you could i'm not saying <laughs> let... <laughs> but you could <laughs> how, how much do you think playing other sports so growing up i mean obviously you talked about the athleticism the movements boxing now how much do those sports translate to pitching and how much are you trying to use that to to make you a better pitcher yeah man personally like i couldn't i couldn't emphasize any more how important I think it is for young the young wave of athletes young kids to play as many sports as possible I think it just helps your overall athleticism helps your body move in different ways helps your body get used to being in different positions like there's so much um there's so many good things you could take from playing soccer from playing basketball from playing football I don't think kids at a young age should ever should ever just focus their abilities on one particular sport because 
I feel like honestly, by doing so, it limits them from being great at that one particular sport because it kind of limits your access, especially as a child when we're young, like our bodies are amazing. And when you can acclimate it and make it move in certain ways, playing different sports, that kind of carries the wave as you get older. And I feel like that's why I'm so good, to be honest with you. It's not necessarily that I'm a great pitcher. It's not necessarily that I'm a great um, baseball player. It's that I'm a great athlete. And by being a great athlete, I feel like I make better in-game adjustments than anybody. Like I'm able to correct myself and know, you know what? My core was off there. My, 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 my left glute wasn't turned on. My hip is a little off. I'm able to make those corrections and feel my body pitch to pitch in game. And I truly feel like that comes from my athletic background. That's interesting because I've seen you, like I watch your games, obviously mm -hmm. I watch every, every start that you, uh, that you yeah. have. And I notice you talking to yourself and you're, you're, you're giving yourself cues like, Hey, you know, I've got to, I've got to get my core uh, yeah. into it. I'm really big on verbal cues. And like, I, I talk to myself a lot and it's a lot of people think I'm talking to them at times, but a lot of the times, man, I also have like a mental coach I work with. And a big thing is, is the ability when we speak things verbally, vocally, the idea of kind of speaking into existence rather than just holding it in and thinking about it, it kind of hits home way different, man. It kind of is like on this whole like mental, spiritual wave where you really feel it. So I'm big into talking to myself when I'm on the mound, keep your core on, engage your ass, engage your glute, get into your legs, breathe. My big thing is breathing, focus on your breath, get in your core, keep your ribs down. I'll tap my ribs to give myself a reminder. So I'm really big, man, in the verbal cues. I feel like that's been a huge help for me over the years. It's, I feel like when I'm able to verbally, verbally express something, it kind of manifests itself. Interesting. And, and is it, it's generally just positive stuff too. I mean, I haven't seen you only like- positive, uh, Only positive stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. And I've noticed you go off on the uh, energy vampires and stuff on uh, mm -hmm. online. And it just seems like, like part of it is everybody wants to tear people down. Like they don't mm -hmm. build people up online or they build you up only to tear you down. And exactly. uh, I mean, it's great to see a positive role model out there. Uh, and it's such a negative world nowadays, man. And, and especially in social media, you know, and I know how positive a person I am. And I have, I have kids, I have adults, I have people from all walks of life, man, who, who reach out to me on the daily, who tell me that I'm their source of inspiration or motivation or, or just by posting a, a quote or saying that I helped them get through a day or a moment of adversity that they might be getting through, man. So that is, I can't put into words how gratifying that is for me. And I can take any hate, man. I'm so calm in my life now. Like I can, I can take whatever it is from anybody, man. And just know the impact that I have on certain individuals in the world and, and, and kind of that's how I go through life. So Honestly, I'm just trying to show the young wave of athletes, man, because it's a hard world with social media and it's so negative. Like you said, I'm just trying to be a positive light for these young athletes who are coming up or young people or anybody in general who's going through any type of adversity who, when they go to their phones, the first thing they're seeing is everything working against them, not everything working for them. So yeah, man, I'm, I'm going to continue to be this positive light. I'm going to continue to ruffle some feathers along the way, but I'm so I'm so content and happy in the individual I turned out to be, and I continue to to look forward to spreading my light. So when you were playing, I mean, playing, who do you look up to? Um, I know David Price has a similar mentality about uh, you know being a faucet versus a drain. Mm -hmm. um, Fa Honestly, man, I don't have like I don't really have many role models in that sense, man. Um, David Price is one of my very few role models, like he is one of the best human beings I've ever been around. Like, I don't even care about baseball. Like he's one of the best people, individuals that I've ever, like, I can't even put it into words. Just, just the most humble down to earth. He'll give you anything you need. If, 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 if it takes him being in a worse situation for you to be in a better situation, he's going to do it. And I can't put that into words, man. There's not people, people like that don't exist in the world. And I've met everybody in the world. I see how negative the world is. I see how it is. So I honor, I honor people like that in the world. You know what I mean? And, and souls like that. So that, that's what I mean when I say I don't have many role models because I don't look up to people. I look up to, I mean, I don't look up to athletes. I look up to people who have good hearts, you know what I mean? And who, who, who do great things in life. And there's not many, man. Like I've met 
some of my role models in life. And honestly, they're no longer my role models. You know what I mean? So like I said, I have very few people who I honor and look up to in life. And David Price is very, very high on that list. That's awesome. Uh, so when you were going, I mean, you put, how, how, were, how was your high school ball experience? Just curious. Mm -hmm. High school was great, man. I had a great, I had a pretty good experience, man. Like I was always like very nose, like work, 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 work. If I wasn't working on my craft, man, I was working on school work. Like in high school, like I was really focused, man. Like it was tunnel vision. My dad was on a wave too. Like my dad had me like very tunnel vision. He had me very motivated, very confident. And we just worked, man. Like I said, I, I didn't have much time. I wasn't going out to any parties. I wasn't playing much. If I wasn't working on my craft or working on me getting better, my dad was handing me additional schoolwork or reading comprehension or this book to read. And then he quizzed me on it. So I'm thankful for my pops, man. Like I said, at times it was very overwhelming. Um, but now I, I, I look back and I'm, I'm so thankful for my dad and, and, and my upbringing. So I think that's, so, I mean, I had a similar thing raising a kid who's a pitcher. Mm -hmm. um, I think kids don't appreciate it necessarily at the time because, mm -hmm. you know, you want to go off and have fun and your, and your dad has a long range view of everything. And it's like, Hey, get, get your school work done. Yeah. It's almost like, Oh, like I can't, I can't do this. I can't go out with my friends tonight. Like, but now, man, I look back and I'm so thankful that I'm not the friends or, or acquaintances at the time who, who panned out the way they did. I'm so happy that I had, his upbringing and his his motives and his 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 mindset instilled in me, man. And the work ethic. The honest the honest thing was the work ethic that my dad instilled in me, man. Like, he would drag me to the gym at five a.m. He would be opening the gym with a key, dragging me at five. Like, he don't miss a workout till this day. He's fifty five and he trains daily. So he taught me like, if you want anything, man, you just gotta go get it and you gotta work. And when other people are playing and other people are doing things, he's like, that's an opportunity to outwork them. He's like, and if you want to get to the top. He's like, he, my dad let me know when I was super young. He's like, you're not going to be the biggest person. He told me straight up. He didn't try to like sugarcoat it. Like, he's like, you're never going to be the biggest dude in the room. He's like, that doesn't matter at all. He's like, you need to know that, you, that you're the biggest person in the room and know that regardless, you have to be the most confident person in the room. So my man told me that when I was young, like probably like, <laughs> probably like way younger than most people have been told that, but probably like five, six, seven years old. My dad's a, my dad's a savage. So like that's kind of like I took that through that like hit home to me and like honestly from that age all I did was work that so you would have been successful no matter what you would have done so you would just pick something I truly believe that yeah like baseball I just do baseball but I truly believe even when I'm done playing baseball like I truly believe I have this next second wave of life where I'm going to be extremely successful into whatever endeavor I get in man well you've started that I mean with with your whole mm -hmm. brand which is awesome yeah, man, I got ACMH, which is incredible, man. Um, Height Doesn't Measure Heart, which is based off my my logo, my brand. I also am starting my foundation. We're starting to get into some really cool endeavors. Um, it's crazy, man, to see the progression of everything, to see it all kind of pan out. It's it's, it's amazing. I'm also, I'm also in the process of writing a children's book, which will be kind of, it'll be, it'll be incorporated. HDMH will be a big facet of that as well. So um, I'm working on this now and I'm also working on producing possibly my own wine. So I always have projects, man. Like I, I, I have so many projects, but it helps me stay locked in on the field. Like the, the, the normal person who looks at me says, oh, he's got all these projects going on. It's a distraction, but they don't understand that I need that distraction in order to keep my mind centered when I'm out there on the mound to be locked in. If I go home and my mind's wandering and I don't have things to focus on when I'm away from the field, I will never be in a proper mental place to go out there and pitch, which it's hard for people to grasp, but that's my true mental state, man. It's just how it works. I think that makes sense. And you also have a champion <laughs> dog too. Yeah, man. I just got him back actually a week ago. He's down here in the Florida circuit, showed in Ocala, he showed in Lakeland. Uh, I think he has a show coming up too soon. So he's ranked 20th right now, man. I pulled him out. <laughs> my trainer hates me because I always pull him out because I just like having him around, man. And when I send him, he has to be gone for a while. So he's ranked 20th right now in the country. He was inside the top 10 at one point, but being on the, being on the circuit is one of those things you have to stay up on top of it. And you have to consistently do. Well, I mean, he's big though. I mean, do you ever feel like you should have gotten a smaller? Are you like, uh... <laughs> I, 
big dogs, man. I grew up with the Rottweiler and a pit bull. Ooh, nice. So I've always liked big dogs, man. Honestly, I, I saw the King Corso and I've just fell in love, man. And I, I just wanted one. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like I, I yeah. always see, I show my wife pictures of him. <laughs> yeah, he's a sweetheart, man. He's a big teddy bear. So going from high school to Duke, um, what made you play college? What did you get out of college? Um, and you know, I went to UNC, so we got that rivalry coming up tomorrow too. So that's a that's a hard rivalry, bro. That's one of the biggest rivalries in sports, right there. Oh hell yeah! Oh, hell. <laughs> but yeah, going to um, I always tell people, man, I'm extremely thankful that I like. I honestly, it wasn't really a decision for me. I mean, I, I guess I roughly did have a decision, but um, financially, it wasn't enough to kind of sway as far as as far as going out of high school, but. Obviously, if you're faced with a financial, like a million bucks, like that's hard to say no to. But I'm always a big proponent, man, of going to college. Like, I'm so thankful I went to college. Like, just not even just my de developmental years as a player, just as a person, as a human being, just learning how to live on your own, just being away, doing your own walking and going to do your own laundry, like providing for your food. For, like, all those things just help you grow in life. You know what I mean? And I think that I get missed out when you get thrown into the, the minor league lifestyle a bit. So I'm a big proponent, man, of college. Also, you don't choose a school like Duke University to just not graduate or, 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 or to just go there for a year or something. So I'm, a, I'm the biggest proponent of education, man. Any way you can further your knowledge, further your education, I think that's the way to go. And, like, and I'm sure you know this, like baseball could be taken away from me any day. So and I'm very aware of that. I've always been very aware of that. And to this day, I've have a I've had a ton of a pretty great accomplishments in, in the big leagues. I was an all star, pitched in playoffs, getting my degree from Duke University still tops all of that um, to this day. Well, I thought it was one of the great stories. I, I remember you sitting in the class watching a game on a yeah. laptop. I think it was, which yeah. was freaking awesome. Yep, yep, yep. That was that summer, man. That summer set me up for my life. I tell people I'm, I, I've never been more thankful to say that I tore my ACL, but that set me up for, I already was one of the most confident people ever that summer. I feel like made me unbreakable, man. Like I truly feel like there's nothing in the world that I can not get through after rehabbing an ACL in five months and being in a class daily, doing all the work and getting my degree. There's not much more that I can't tackle. You know what I mean? So I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's insane. Like yeah. coming back from an ACL like that, did you know you were going to do that? I mean, like that was a goal, obviously. Like did, how much did you have to work to get that done? Man, I had to work a ton. The program at the Blue Jays had me on the time, had me way behind schedule with their training staff there at the time. So when I showed up to Duke, I was behind schedule. And I ended up returning to play in five and a half months on an ACL, which is a normal, normal, normal to nine to 12. It's not, you don't, not really good to like 12 months. And I was back on a mound pitching in four months. And I was back at the big league level, five and a half months. It's like the most incredible thing I've ever done, man. That's why going through season and going through adversity is easy. Now I would literally wake up. I'll just give you a quick day. I'd wake up Monday. I'd wake up every day before, before breakfast, stretch, foam roll, soft tissue, eat around seven, 7.30, go to my first workout from usually like 8 to 9.30. From there, I'd go straight to class. From class, my homie would bring me lunch and a change of clothes. From class, I'd go straight to another workout. From my workout, i go straight to another class. I did that Monday to Friday, and then Saturday, I'd have full pool day workout, and then Sundays, I'd be so tired, I would literally just try and sleep to, to get ready to do it again. And when I tell you there was no special treatment. I was in every single class, doing every single paper, doing every single report, writing every single note. I was, I could wholeheartedly say that. And I take a lot of pride in that, man, because I know how much work it is and how mentally challenging that was, how much challenge it was on my body. Like it makes everything going through life easy, man. Like after going through that. So I'm thankful for my doctors who I had there, Dr. Robert Butler, Dr. Jason Shutt. They both took unbelievable jobs with the St. Louis Cardinals. Nikki Huffman took a head trainer role with the Blue Jays. It's one of the only females to ever do that. And now she works independently contracting. She's my trainer. She works with Nolan Arenado and she works with a few others as well. So it was a legendary summer, man. Like, honestly, I've, 
I'm, I'm going to try and do like a, a piece on it soon, like a show or like a little YouTube on that summer because it was, it was incredible. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely crazy. Were you as big a celebrity on campus as some of the basketball players at Duke? This is the other thing, man. Nobody knew me on campus. <laughs> really? Was, I loved it though, man. I was a normal student. Like I actually had some classes with some basketball students there and I'm not going to name any names, but I'd be in there taking notes and these students and those guys were getting up, leaving halfway through class, dipping out. Like, so, like I said, I was a normal student. There was no special peripheral, like there was none of that. I was in, like I said, I was in every class doing everything on time, um, making sure all my work was hand in. I was printing out papers as I was getting my work in, in the morning at my training facility. Like, it was crazy, man. It was crazy. And like I said, after after doing that, it just makes going through life very easy now. Yeah, I would imagine. And this is going to help you going forward with with all the various interests you have. Oh, 100 percent, man. I, I, I have so many. I have so many goals, man. Like my bucket list is like endless, but I want to do it all, man, in life. And I, I truly believe I will. But obviously, my priority right now is, is winning a World Series and winning in Cy Young. And when I say that's priority, that's priority, man. Like I I. I I'm a five, I'm five foot seven, man. So I don't have the luxury of, of taking any time or taking any breaks as far as preparation, as far as when it comes to doing that. So I, when it takes a lot, man, for me to be good out there. And when I like my off season, it's like, when I say I have full days of training or recovery, like they're full days of dry needling, hyperbaric chamber, cryo, sauna, uh, full workouts, dry, like, it's crazy. It's crazy. And it takes so much, which people never see. You know what I mean? People don't understand. They think we just go out there and we throw a baseball. But in order to be like that, I like like that out there. Like I said, I dedicate, man, so much time away from my family, so much time, like really focusing on my mind and my body in order to be a lead out there. So you say, uh, I mean, obviously you want to win the Cy Young and, and, and I don't see any reason you can't, but you have some teammates mm -hmm. that are pretty darn good too. Man. Honestly, I'm a realistic guy too. Like <laughs> my goal is to win the Cy Young. So that's where my work mentally, that's how I prepare. But at the end of the day, I'm happy with my, whatever my results are going to be. I'm already good with my results because I know that I have exhausted every opportunity to prepare my mind and body. There's nothing more that I can do. So that's why I have so much calm now, man. And just knowing when I go out there, I truly think I'm going to be great. But even if I'm not great in particular starts, like I know it won't last because I know how much I prepare. Um, but like you said, man, DeGrom is unbelievable. So I'm not like if DeGrom, as long as he stays healthy for 30, 30 starts, he's going to win. This. DeGrom's going <laughs> to win. Like I tell everybody this, bro. Like I, DeGrom's the best pitcher in baseball, bro. Like, I, it's no debate. It's not even close to a debate with me. It's not even remotely a d discussion. And I thought this before being around him. After being around him, it's just kind of set. It just kind of puts it in stone, man. Like, that guy is the mo one of the most elite pitchers, I think, that we will ever speak about. So I'm excited, man, to be around him, man, because it's cool for me. I, I literally go out and just watch his bullpens, bro, like a little kid. Like, I'm like a little kid out there, bro. Like I sit behind him, right behind him in his bullpens. Like he lets me sit there, chill, ask him questions. He's the man, bro. He's so low key, but he's the man. And he's always open to helping and, and always helping. Like we just wants you to be your best as well. So I'll pick his mind. I'll go into a bullpen and pick his mind, man. To be honest, like people don't understand, but I have a lot of little tweaks that I'm going to be coming out with this year that I've DeGrom inspired man whether it be maybe where my foot position is is on the on the mound or where my hand pump is or what it is DeGrom's thinking about when he has his hand pump or when he lifts his leg like I've incorporated a lot of things that he's doing that have helped me stay more compact and more stable and fluid in my delivery DeGrom's got the best mechanics I tell anybody and a lot of it's a lot of it's his body how much of an athlete he is a lot of it's also physical and what he was born with um, I think DeGrom has the best hip disassociation at any pitcher or anybody in the league. And I think that you can't replicate it. This is why you can't say, oh, go have DeGrom's mechanics. Nobody can have that. His hip disassociation, his ability to, to open up his hips on his stride length and keep his, his top half still loaded back is fucking incredible. Like, it is like, you can't teach that. 
you can't you can't teach it like it's an elastic it's an elastic mobility rubber band that like he's born with he he, he has created since birth or whatever it is but you can't go and tell a pitcher to go be like Degrom. Degrom is a one of one. Degrom is is a goat. Like he like you can't beat Degrom. So what I try to do is I try to pick up little things that he's thinking about in his thought process or why he's doing what he's doing that you can apply to you in your own way. You know what I mean? I'm not gonna go out there and be. You know what? I'm gonna do everything he's doing because that doesn't work. Because I'm not six six, lanky and tall. I'm five seven, short and stocky. <laughs> So I, I can't move like that. You know what I mean? So being around him, man, has been a blessing, honestly. And I can't wait to be around him for a full year. Like, I can't wait. Like, I think I'm going to learn so much from him. Plus, my body, my mind's at the best place it's been in my career. Like, I'm my future, I truly believe my best years are ahead of me. So I'm just excited, man. I think that's awesome. What do you think? So what do you think separates him? What else? I mean, like, his mentality is so different from from yours on the mound. I think he seems, uh, he's more low key um, and, and, and almost like uh, he's very intense, but very low key. In- yes, that's a perfect way to explain a man. Like he's very intense, but low key. Like he tries to be as low key on the mound as possible. Like you're really gonna see him really come out of his zone, which I love. That works for him. This is why I tell people like, everyone's always like, Marcus, why don't you be like DeGrom and be quiet? I'm like, because that's not going to make me be my best version of myself. I can go out there and be low key and not say a word, but by doing so, when you take away from being yourself, you take away opening a realm, a, a, a level of potential that you can't tap into when you're being restricted, when you're like, you know what? I'm just going to be like this. When you play like that, it don't work. And and any real athlete at the highest level will let you know that. In order to be elite, you need to be your true self out there. Even if it's going to ruffle some feathers, it doesn't matter. But like you said, DeGrom, he's himself. He's himself out there. Like, that's how DeGrom is off the field, too. But don't for a second think that DeGrom's not intense just because he's low-key. Because like I said, he'll come in and and he'll have some spurts where he's, he's hot, man. Like, he demands perfection. That's why I love DeGrom. Like, he demands perfection and he'll come in and like be upset over a blue. He'll have a perfectly clean in and, and he'll be upset over, a, over a nasty pitch that he threw where a guy got a, a blue hit over it. You know what I mean? Like, I love that. And that just shows you the level of perfection that he's seeking, which, which is rare in the game. Because like I just said, guys would be happy. Oh, I got out of the inning. You know what I mean? That's how most guys are. And I kind of play both parts. I'll be like that sometimes, but then I'll also be on that DeGrom wave sometimes where I'm like, I have a perfectly cleaning. I'm like, how did that guy hit that? Or like, what? Like, that was like, you know what I mean? You're kind of questioning. That's how DeGrom is. He's always constantly seeking perfection. Like I said, if DeGrom makes 32 starts or if DeGrom makes whatever amount of starts he needs to qualify for this Cy Young, I truly believe this. I've told everyone this. I think DeGrom will win the, I think he'll win the Cy Young every year. I, 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 I truly believe this. If it was a full season last year, I think he gets the Cy Young. Like, over 162 games, no one's messing with that guy. Anybody could be good in 10 games. For, for over a 60-game season, you could put together easily a 10-game spur. No one's messing with DeGrom over 30, 32, 33 starts. I will say that to the death of me, man. Like, that guy's on a different level. Well, I think the the great point you made, and I think kids don't understand this, coaches a lot of times don't understand this, is, is they try to cookie cut people. They say, be like DeGrom, move like him. Mentally, they think, you know, this is the way you should be. And I know you fought that, but you have people like Scherzer and Kluber were to- totally different personalities. Kluber, stone face, Scherzer 100%. yells at people. So you got to be yourself. You have to, man. That's such a key. And like you said, Unfortunately, a lot of coaches, even in pro ball, man, like they try to make people cookie cutter. Like they try to make this person, you know what? Let's make him like this person. And every individual and a human being is their own person. Everyone is so unique. Everyone is an individual. Everyone is one of one. Every person when they're born, like you're a one of one. You're not like the next person. It's not one of two. You're not born of one of two. You're not born of one of three. So how are you going to tell me to go be like this guy? You know what I mean? So I'm big into that, man. And honestly, I, I faced that all coming up. I won't name names or where it came from, but everyone tried to make me cookie cutter. I had I had coaches come over in the Blue Jays organization when I was coming up, 
trying to tell me to raise my arms fly. Pitch like this guy. You need to throw from this angle so you're throwing more down. Had me throwing 50, 60 pitch bullpens where my arm, I couldn't even feel my arm the next day, changing shit. And I was actually listening to these guys at the point, man. And I'm like, I look back, back now, I'm like, thank God I didn't get injured. And thank God I had the ability to be like, you know what? I'm going to do this shit my way, bro. Like, if I'm, if I'm going to go out this game, if I'm going to be pushed out this game, or if I'm, gonna, if I'm not going to be great, it's going to be my way. Like, you can't tell me to, to, to go and be this way. And like you said, I'm 5'7". The next guy's 6'2". Like, everyone's different. Everyone's got different builds. Everyone's got different mentals. This guy can't pitch the same. Every, some guys like to yell and show emotion. I'm the type of guy where I've realized that with my mental coach, we've talked about it. I'm not the type of guy who can be stoic out there. And you know what? Let's just hold it all in for seven innings and not say anything. Because guess what? That's going to work against me. And now I'm going to be so bottled up and tense. That's going to fuck with my pitches, my mobility, my mind, everything. I'm the type of guy who, yeah, I'm going to let out a yell in the moment whenever the hell I want to, because guess what? That's what I need to be great. And that's what I'm going to do in the moment because that makes me great. And that's what's going to put me at my highest level. The umpire might not like it. The other team might not like it. The crowd might not like it. People might not like it. Guess what? I don't care. Because in order for me to be a lead out there for my teammates and my members and put us in the best position to win, you have to be yourself. And, and, and in order to get to your true maximum elite potential, which I think a lot of guys don't get to in professional ball, in college, anywhere, at any level, because they feel like, you know what? I can't be myself. And you only have a small window of opportunity. You get passed by. If you're not being yourself for two or three years, guess what? There's the next guy who's being himself, who's flying right by you, taking your opportunity. So, like, you have to, man. It's a priority on literally. If being yourself is going to put you in your best mind state, it's going to put you in the best position to go out there and dominate, be yourself. I don't care what it is. I tell everybody this. If you got to yell at someone, if you got to go in the dugout and, 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 and break things, if you got whatever it may be, as long as you're not putting your body at harm or injury, get it out, man. Go yell. Go in the tunnel and scream. Go go get curses out. If you're on the field and you punch somebody out, let it all out. Let a fist pump. Hype your teammates up, man. Like, have fun with it, man. Like, I'm going to do what I want, man. I, I had this, like, calming feeling recently, like, going forward. Like, there's going to be nobody, no media, no nothing that's going to tell me how I should or shouldn't act. Because I know my teammates genuinely love it. I know it's me being genuine. I know it's me who I am as a person. So there's nothing no one can tell me, man, going forward. That's that's the kind of the wave I'm on. <laughs> I, I think that's awesome because, I, I number one, I think coaches have tried to bake that out of people. And I think mm. uh, I talked to AG about the same thing. He said he tried to do the stone face thing, like don't show emotion. He said he sucked at it. It made him terrible. I've had a few games, honestly, in my career where I've, where I've done it. And I've been bad. And not only have I been bad, I just haven't felt normal. Like you just go through games and it's just like, this is like, not me. Like I'm sitting here just like literally trying to hold everything in. It's like, for what? You know what I mean? Just because a couple media members said Strowman, he's controversial when he shows excitement. You know what I mean? Like, come on, man. These are his media members. There's one guy with one perspective. Who, who cares, bro? Forget all these guys. <laughs> I think that's a, I think that's the thing that has hurt baseball from getting fans into the sport. Hundred percent, man. Did you see? I just I just on Twitter now. This is why I was late. I was late to this convo because I came from boxing. I got sidetracked, and then I got on Twitter, and like obviously we didn't get Bauer. I'm sure everyone. Oh, sorry. Everyone saw <laughs> we didn't get, but it came out yesterday that we were gonna get Bauer. It was like official. I'm sure you've been keeping up with this, and then today it came out to Dodgers. So you got these media members, man. Like. So negative, bro. We picked up Lindor, Carrasco, Trevor May, Lucchese, Loop, like McCann. And the media members tweet, no Bauer, no Springer, no Real Muto. Welcome back, Mets. Bro, I don't got time for that shit, bro. Like, you are a pessimist, bro. Like, your, your life is negative. And just because you have a platform, now you're spreading all this negative ass hate to the fan base. I got no time for that, man. Like, I'm going to say what I want. I don't care for these guys no more. Like, so I tweeted, you go look at my tweet. I said I to him, did you see it? Yeah, I saw it. I'm like, dude, are these not unbelievable additions for any team in any off season? Bro, we had a Lindor and Carrasco. That'll let alone. Plus McCann, May, Lucchese, Luke. 
Yamamoto, we have unbelievable pitching depth. We got an unbelievable lineup. Bro, we have every reason to be excited. Now you have media members with a little blue check. Oh, these guys get a little blue check and they start to feel themselves. Oh, okay. And now they spew all this negative hate and shit to the fan base. And now the fan base is arguing about it. Now the fan base gets negative. Now the, it's, 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 a, it's a terrible cycle, man. That's how the world is. That's what we were talking about earlier. It's how it is. It's a negative ass world, man. And like, I won't cave to it. I won't cave to it. Like I'm never gonna cave into like, my life is too amazing, too positive, man, to cave into these negative people, you know? Well, I am looking forward to your, uh, to your children book too, man. Cause that's gonna be, yeah. I love the one-on-one, the, the one of one concept. I think that that's something that kids have it's to understand. It's funny you said that one of one, I'm actually, my tattoo artist is flying in tomorrow. I'm getting one of one. I have rare breed tatted going down my shin. And I'm getting one of one tatted going down my other shin probably tomorrow. So it's funny you, you, you said that. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yeah. You also have a, a, a Peaky Blinders tattoo, right? I'm a Shelby, man. That's my guy, bro. That's my, that's my low key. Like I've never, I've never watched a series and have like mentally felt a character more, bro. So like, I felt like I was like with him and like just the way he took care of his family, how he was kind of the guy who wanted to be that person just all his ups and downs, how he always kind of gets back to level ground, man. I have like a lot of respect for that character. So like, and I don't, I'm super picky with shows and characters. So I was like, oh, I need them tatted. I got them tatted. I need them tatted on me. <laughs> That's, can you, can you do by, uh, by order of the peaky who can by order of the finders. I was thinking about putting none of there. I have, I have him smoking a cig, which is just a portrait. And then right to the side of him, I have a, a side profile of him with the hat with the with the hat on which is like you need to get that in there <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome you uh i mean are you a little jealous that Tyler glassnow actually looks like him a little bit he... bro i know it's funny because like you know at twitter's people are like you got glass no tat i was like i close my back so you got glass no tat on your back <laughs> <laughs> no, no, glass, glass that was a fucking legend man like wow what a what a talented individual man bro i'm like the biggest i love just watching like I'm a fan, man. Like I'm such a fanboy, bro. When I'm when I watch, like, like whenever I'm watching your account, man, I'm looking at these pitches. Like I'm legit a fan, bro. I'm like, holy shit! Like, look at that shit is nasty. You know what I mean? So I love it, man. I'm all for like, I love like, obviously pitchers. It's like we're we're our own entity. Like we always keep tabs on each other. It's like our own culture too. So I love seeing it, man. He's he's gonna be a great pitcher, bro. I'm I'm honestly excited because I think he's. He's one of those few guys who's like, I think he's going to continually get better. You know what I mean? I don't think a lot of guys like come in, they're great for a year or two or, or three. And then it's like, they kind of wander out. Like, I truly think he's like, he's going to progress, man. And it's going to be scary. Like I, he's not even like at his, like nowhere near his potential. That's what people don't realize. <laughs> That's what people don't realize. He's like, he's still out there just kind of messing around a bit. Like when he like, when he gets to that peak, man, it's going to be scary, scary. So that's a great point because I think so sometimes taller pitchers have a harder time because it takes mm -hmm. them a while to grow into their frame. He's one of those, he's six foot eight. Like that dude yeah, is a, a giant. It's a lot of moving parts. And honestly, it's a lot of, it's a lot of stability. Those guys need to do more stability than I do. And I, I, I'm the biggest core stability proponent. Like that's honestly, I'm going in a year eight, man. I'm five, seven. I'm going to be able to pitch. Like people don't understand. Like I'm going to be able to pitch bro for a long time. Like, at five seven because my body is unbelievable people say whatever they want like i take care of it to to the 10th degree so i got no problem talking about it to that because you know like guys don't last in the league it's hard to have a long career especially as a starting pitcher to go and pitch 10 11 12 13 years man that's hard to do you got to be elite and you got to come with it and stay healthy so i'm going into year eight man i'm looking forward to being one of those guys like that's that's kind of what I, I i pride myself on you know what i mean oh absolutely and i think to some extent you're able to take advantage of timing everything up because you're so in sync and you're, and a lot mm -hmm. of these other guys, you know, the, the, the scouts love it. They see a guy that's six ten or six eight or whatever. And they're like, that's my guy. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, it takes them a long time to get there. They may never. Exactly. But that's why it's like, I hate that the, the ideal starting pitching, it's still, it's like the ideal pitcher build is like six, two, six, whatever it may be. You know what I mean? But like you said, everybody is different. So there might be a guy five eight five nine who's able to use his body incredible properly, and I actually have I actually have which at some point I think will come out, but um, I end up signing back with the with the Mets. But I have a bio like a bunch of these biomechanical 
biomechanical breakdowns of my body and basically stating how how long I'm gonna be able how long I'm gonna be able to play and how much less wear and tear I put on my body than everybody in the league. It's actually like very eye-opening, man, because of my mechanics and because of my core and stability. I can, I'm gonna pitch for a long time. That's what people don't realize. And like this is science, this is proven by science as well. Um, I'm not max effort, man. Like I move so easy. Like everything I do out there, it's 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 it doesn't take a lot for me to move. It doesn't take much effort. But like you said, I've spent so much time in the weight room, man. Not a lot of pitchers do that. They put a priority on being on the mound, on on going to throw. And I'm the opposite. I'm the opposite. I, I want my body to be at the best possible potential before I even touch the mound. Um, so like you said, I feel like, man, I honestly feel like the training is going to shift in pitchers and athletes in the next five to 10 years. If you keep up with functional movement screening or, or Greg Cook, um, Dr. Lee Burton, which are those two guys are kind of like the the guys who I look up to more than anyone in the space because they're geniuses when it comes to the body. But I'm talking about them because they train, they're pretty much trained and go about the body like five, 10 years down the road from now. They're way in the future. And that's exactly how I take care of my body. Baseball is very stuck in training methods and lifts and, and certain things that literally do not help you have a long career. It actually works against you, but it's so ingrained in the baseball. Like I said, you're going to start to see a shift in how athletes, pitchers train that would help them pitch much longer with less injury, less soreness in between starts, and just feel way better once they get into, like I said, Greg Cook and Dr. Lee Burton, who are the inspirations for the doctors who train me in my rehab are the geniuses. And that's kind of the, the format on how I train my body. Once we get these pitchers, like like the pitchers you're saying, with the six four, six five, six six frames, on this training method, on, on this wave, I think it's like it's going to be scary, man. But it it seems like baseball, maybe it's all sports. They get stuck in mm -hmm. a rut and they have one way of thinking, and it needs to be yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to break out of that. And it, I love the way you take charge of your career because mm -hmm. so many people, and this is a thing that I see with kids in high school, kids in college, all they do is they say, yes, sir, no, sir, listen to your coach. And I think their coach knows everything. In the end, it's your career. It's your career, man. And honestly, if I would have taken that approach, I tell people this all the time. If I would have taken that approach, I would not be in the big leagues any, any longer. If I would have kept training by being the yes man and listening to what everyone said, this is the way. I tell people this all the time. Like when I was a rookie, when I used to do the, the whatever, the, the generalized training programs and all this was, I used to feel like I get hit by a bus after a start. Like it would take me so long to recover. My body was always sore. I wasn't lifting or training properly. It took me to tear my ACL, to have my doctors at Duke University tell me that my body was not in the proper place where it should be, to tell me that I was training wrong when I thought it was all gravy and all perfect to tell me and point it out, literally to break down my mechanics. You see where this is wrong? Terrible hip stability. You look at your rib position, look at your, look at your right hip, look at your left hip, look at your leg strength. To tell me all my deficiencies. Meanwhile, I was getting fed that, oh, I'm this, 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 and this, and great. So like I said, everyone is different and you have to be open to always changing and adapting. Because like I said, I'm not doing anything that I was doing when I got drafted. I'm not doing anything that I was doing three, four years ago. And I truly believe that in order to be great in this game, you consistently have to adapt because your body's always changing. Um, you, you have to be able to, to, to move on the go. If you, if you are that individual or athlete who's stuck in your ways and scared of growth or, or, or afraid to change, I don't think you'll ever truly reach your true, true potential. Like there's no way. I honestly tell everybody this. I'm like, I'm trying to learn and change and adapt and grow until the day I die. Like there's gonna be never a point where I'm like, I don't wanna learn more or I don't wanna change for the better or I don't wanna adapt to, to increase my value of life or to make me feel like, you know what I mean? So a lot of athletes get stuck in their ways. They're like, you know what? I had success in college. This is how I gotta do things. What you did a year ago, what I did three days ago might not necessarily work tomorrow. So I think a lot of athletes get stuck in that rut, man, for sure. Like. 
you always have to be adapting and changing, man. I can truly say if I was stuck in my ways, I would have been out of the league with a regular job by now because I needed to tear my ACL almost to learn that I wasn't training properly. And I had the ability when I tore my ACL to stay with the team and do that and go through their training properly. But that was the best decision of my life was to go back to Duke University and get with the training staff and to completely change the way I took care of my body. It was the biggest thing I've ever done. That's amazing that probably your biggest setback in your career and the biggest injury ended up being the best thing that happened to you. And too many people don't take advantage of that. 100%, 100%. Like you said, a lot of people, a lot of people mourn and feel bad for themselves and look at it like, oh, you know what, man, like this is it. I have never been like that. I've, I've always have seen if hell was about to burn over today, I will somehow find that little bit of sunshine or that little bit of cloud somewhere, that little silver lining in there. That's how I've always been. I don't see, I don't see negative because there's no need to dwell on negative. There's no point in spending time on anything bad because it's only going to work against you. So when I tore my ACL, man, like this is what I told people, like the doctor t pulled on my ACL, told me right away, you tore your ACL. I said, okay, can you leave the room? I literally had a little emotional moment to myself, probably for five, 10 minutes. I got on my phone, I called my mom, I said, mom, I wanna go back to school, can you please start this process? I did that in the moment, not the next day, not two days, not three days down the road. I tore my ACL the moment of, I called my mom and said, I wanna go back to school, I wanna rehab and get my degree. So that's just how I move, it was like, I wasn't gonna sit there and be like, oh, I feel bad for myself for a week and be like, you know what? I was gonna be so good this year and who knows what's gonna happen. I was like, nah, you know what? I'm gonna go get my degree, I'm gonna rehab. Who knows, maybe if I rehab, great, maybe I'll come back. I kind of thought like that out, like I kind of put that in the, in, in, in the air. Like, you know what, maybe, maybe it's possible. Even though I thought like nine to 12 months ACL is probably not like, but I threw it in the air. I was like, you know what? Let's go back to school, change my scene, go into it with the open heart, good vibes. Let's see what happens. And it turned out great. I, I think I felt worse for you than you did then because I was <laughs> depressed. And I remember when you said the comeback will be legendary. And I uh -huh. like tweeted that out because I was like, I was like, shit, Marcus is here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man. And it, it was legendary, bro. Like I did definitely didn't dwell, man. That was honestly like I look back at that moment. That was like one of the most crucial moments of my career, man. Because if I feel if I would have left that moment, I would have dwelled on it for days, maybe weeks. Then maybe I wouldn't have gone back to school. Then maybe I would have just sat around spring training and, and just rehabbed and went home and felt bad for myself every day. Like that was, that was a, that was a life changing moment, man, for sure. Well, I think this is going to be really inspirational for kids. Again, I'm going back to the children's book, like your mm -hmm. stories and your outlook is really, really good for kids to read to me. So yeah, uh, man. And like, I, I see, man, like I, I don't, I lose sight of how much of an influence I have on like young kids, man. Like I open my DM sometimes, man. And I'm like, I'm taken back, man, by like kids writing me full blown stories daily of HCMH, of, of how a quote that I said this day of how I'm their source of inspiration, how they wake up and they look at my story and see I'm training and it gives them a reason to go about their day. Like I've had people reach out to me, older people with cancer, say that I'm a source of their inspiration and motivation. Like, I've had people from all walks of life, athletes, non-athletes, all ages, literally reach out to me and say, like, I'm a reason why they've gotten through a dark point in their life. Like, you know how incredible that is? Like, I got the chills just now, like, thinking about that. Like, yeah, throw a baseball. That's unbelievable. That is unbelievable to throw a baseball at the highest level in the big leagues. Like, I'm super thankful. But for someone to literally like, I, like, I don't post anything. Like, I want to post it sometimes, but like, I, I literally keep screenshots in my phone of like all the messages I get. It's like overwhelming, man. Like the positive support, like, it's a blessing, man. It's another reason why I'll continue to be myself regardless because I know that I'm reaching, even if I'm not reaching anybody, I'm reaching at least a, hundreds of people daily with these positive talk, and it's literally helping them just to see it. And just to know there's somebody out there that's going through something or there's, some, there's somebody out there that's spewing positive in a world full of negative, I'll continue to always be that man through my death for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and the thing is, if you were, a, if you were a, uh, a robot, you wouldn't have that impact. You still might be good. Like, hey, you're great. But mm -hmm. what impact did you have on society? And people look up to you because they can relate. 
Exactly, man. Exactly. And like you said, I'm at the point where I know the impact that I can have and I see it daily. So it's so that inspires me, man. Like I wrote back to someone today who wrote me a, a young kid who wrote me this massive response, man. Like I was almost at like tears, but I wrote back to him. I was like, you're inspiring me to be the best version of myself. He's telling me I'm inspiring him. I'm like, hearing what you're writing and seeing this, I'm like, I, I'm about, I want to go do another workout. I want to go train some more so I can go out there and put on for you and put on for the people who are like, put on for the people who genuinely want me to, to strive and, and, and be great in life. Because one of those people outweighs millions of, of negative people to me. And I know how many of those positive people I have that are supporting me, man. So it's, it's, it's a blessing, honestly. Yeah. And it's like, so that's the opposite. You have that one sports writer who always looks at the negative and it makes them sound smart. Uh, mm -hmm. But meanwhile, the fans don't want to dwell on the negative. The fans want to, like, they want to be entertained. They want someone to relate to. The fans want to be, get excited for, for positive things, get excited for the season. What fan wants to be like, oh, you know, uh, we got a million, we, we've got a million great additions, but you know, we didn't get one thing. So let's be negative. Like, we have so many positive things to look to, especially like for the Mets organization. Like this is an exciting time. Like we're going to, we're going to be great. Like we're going to be really good. Like to the point where you're going to want to tune in and watch us every day. You know what I mean? And that's an exciting time to be in. So who, like, how can you not see the positive? We got Francisco Lindor, Carlos Carrasco. Like <laughs> yeah, it's, it's sick. To me that anyone that everyone can look past that and just be like, you know what? We didn't even get one guy. It's a bad off season. How can you say yeah, I guess. Yeah, that, that that's insane. Um, and I mean, I'm excited to see what y'all do. Like, I think that the moves have been great. The vibes are on the team are going to be crazy too. So when you have great vibes on a team, man, like that, that makes winning and everything easily achievable too, which people don't understand. Like, I've always vibed with Lindor. Like, he's always been a homie, low key, like side. We've always kept in touch. Like. Whereas always people who pride ourselves on always smiling and, and, and being positive and hopping around. So it's going to be some fun times, man. Carrasco as well, man. He lives like 30, 40 minutes from me. We have the same barbers. So he's an unbelievable human being, bro. And people forget how nasty Carrasco is. And like, this guy is filthy. So like, and it's funny to me, man, because just people forget. That's the biggest thing. It's like, it's it, it's a society of what have you done for me lately and by lately like literally like yesterday you know what I mean so I'm over here just smiling and laughing because I know how good we're gonna be I know people forgot how good I am which is fine like I don't care because I know how good I'm gonna be I was an all-star in 2019 I just put a priority on my body and my mind for 2020 like I'm coming with it all future regardless of what anybody thinks like there's nobody that can stop my progression like so I'm excited man for our staff for our team for New York I think it should be nothing but excitement to look forward to, man. I mean, if you're seriously dwelling on a piece or two that we didn't add when we added crazy pieces to the roster, like th th this is what I said to the guy too. I don't know if you saw the second tweet. I was like, this is a perfect example of a pessimist, of someone who sees the glass half empty. So I kind of turn it in perfect as like how you should not see the world because it it's obvious it's like, why not throw out a tweet that says, instead of like that, why not throw out a tweet that says, you know what, Lindor, Carrasco, throw out a tweet like that. Even though we didn't get that, we have an amazing group of dudes to look forward to. Let's go, Mets. Bro, like, <laughs> just because he has a little check on his little page, like, this is crazy, man. Like, the little check be empowering these people, you know what I mean? Like, they think they're, they think they're somebody, man, and it's like, you need to relax and realize, like, just because the society thinks you're somebody and you accumulated a fan base, you now you now now your weight now your voice holds a little weight, and you need to be you need to you need to understand that. Even though you want to spew your negative thoughts that pop up into your head all the time, understand that you have a fan base. You're reporting on a fan base. Sweet, congratulations, you got a blue check. So just know that, and just know that maybe sometimes when you have a negative thought like that, maybe that stays in your draft. Maybe that's the one you write out and you hit the X button and you put it in your drafts or you exit out and you say, you know what? Let's really think about this. Let's step back for a second. Let's remove myself and my negative self from the picture. And let's step back from an overall viewpoint and see it from the fan base point. What are people going to want to hear at a time of adversity like this? 
let's go with the negative. Like who does that? <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it is so crazy. I think people forgot how good Cookie is though. Like he is insane. Insane. That dude, I, I'm, I'm honestly, Carrasco, I'm very picky with guys that I'll go back and actually like watch games. Like I watch your highlights, everything. But when I, to actually go back and watch a game, I don't go back and watch game. There's very few guys. Cookie's one of those guys, bro. I will go back and watch his games. Like I will watch his sequences. I will watch that slider and that split. Like that shit is nasty. And that's what I'm saying. People like, how do you forget that? People forget this. You need to do me a favor. Can you, can you throw up a little cookies? After oh, this hey. He throw up a little Carrasco, um, like his little vintage highlights of nasty pitches. I need a little Met staff. I need a little Met staff, a little, little montage, bro, just to remind I people. <laughs> I got you. I, I like literally, I grew up a Met fan too. So like okay. I, yeah, so I, I got you on this. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. So do you have a baseball around? You want to go over some grips or something? Or you? Yeah, you can. Let me, um, let me grab one. Be right back. Okay. All right, my guy, I'm giving you my grips. I give nobody my grips, bro. I, I know. I, I, I flashed my grips one time and they weren't even my real grips, bro. Like a while ago in a playoff screen and like they got, but I, I, I never get my grips, but let's do this. All right, let's go. All right. Uh, what are we going with first? You call it. Lord, let's go uh, sinker because I've been trying to get you to share that for a while. All right. So before I get into grips, man, I'm going to be straight up because I know there's going to be young, young pitchers watching this man and young wave. Like I truly believe grips pitching mechanics I, I truly believe it's all individual and unique to the individual yes it's easy you could go play with grips all the time if someone shows you a grip go play with it but when you play with it don't be so prone to keeping that exact grip this is what i try to tell people like all my like, i hold the ball weird just because naturally in my hand that's more comfortable like i'm going to show you but my grip is not going to work for probably most people. There might be a few guys out there who it might work for, but the way I hold the ball, it's like insane. And it's something that I had to find for myself. Um, because I used to try to throw a sinker in a two seam my entire life and had nothing, no type of action. I used to cut. And it's something that I found after I was already in the big leagues playing with the ball on the couch. It just felt so comfortable. I felt it on the two seam. I said, all right, I'm going to go play catch with it. Play catch with it threw a bullpen with it in the same week it was in the game the next time like i'm someone who i'll put a new pitch in the game literally like if i learned a pitch the day before i'll put it in the game the next day <laughs> like i don't care but let's do this all right. all right let me put this phone up real quick okay okay so sinker man i essentially can throw a slider from my sinker grip and i have before i've been like mid delivery I knew it. Before. i've had a, i've been mid delivery before I work quick sometimes. I've been mid-delivery and have already like started my delivery and lifted my leg. And I had a sinker grip and the catcher threw down slider and I've thrown it off of it. So this is the grip. I'm like very torque. So I'm across the ball. Like a normal, so if you look at my thumb, like a normal person for sinker or something like is like this, like straight up on the two seam. I take the ball and I torque it this way so it's essentially a, almost a one seam i'm throwing it's coming off my my off the outside of my middle finger so when i release the ball it's it's essentially it's not even a singer like on, on the rap soto like it's crazy man it comes up as like a reverse like it comes up as like reverse slider or like something crazy the way it's didn't i call i think i called it that so, yep yeah yeah exactly because it doesn't spin like my shit like doesn't spin like it's weird man it's weird how it spins so, like I was saying, like, all my pitches I throw, whereas pitchers mostly are, like, straight up, I take all my pitches and I, I move the ball like that. Even my – it's like this is a normal slider grip. I take it and I, and I torque it. And every pitch I throw, like, this is my sinker. So, if you look, this is my thumb placement. This is my sinker. Every pitch I throw is pretty, like, tight, tight in my hand. Like, I don't hold anything pretty loose. So, yeah, man. You got a little so space like, there, too, between your fingers? Say it again. A little space between your fingers. Yeah, so it's weird. If you look, they touch at the top, but there's a space like in between. That's what I'm saying. Like this is hard for people's like, fingers to even get in this position. Like they touch at the top, but naturally, I'm not even trying to do that. But naturally, there's just like a little space. And honestly, I don't think this is a grip pitch, man. I don't think about trying to do anything. I don't think about trying to pronate. I don't think about trying to make it sink. 
which is gratifying. This is the pitch I grip and I just throw it, man. And it's got great, like great action every time, man. Great action. Yeah, it's it, it broke my brain trying to figure out what you did because I slowed it down and I'm seeing the spin. I'm like, that doesn't look like a sinker. It comes off literally like, can you see that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Like that. that outside of my middle finger so it's essentially almost a one scene the way it almost comes off yeah that's yeah. sick but <laughs> I, so so to echo what you said just like people's mentalities are different and mechanics are different it's just, i mean your, your arm slots different your fingers are different your finger exactly. shapes are different yep exactly. so i tried throwing a normal sinker i used to i tried a million grips for sinkers and two seams None of them worked for me until I found one when I was playing the ball on my couch that was like, I'm a big comfort guy too. Any pitch I throw, it's got to feel, before I throw it, it's got to feel comfortable in my hand. It's got to feel like so comfortable. Like it's got to feel like it's one with my, with my hand and my fingers. I'm never going to throw a pitch that doesn't feel comfortable. You know what I mean? That doesn't feel, even if it's like a nasty grip or it's got great action, if it doesn't feel comfortable in my hand and in my fingers, I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw it. So the sinker was something I found just playing with the ball, playing with the seams. I like gripped it like that. I was like, wow, that feels really comfortable. I feel like that's going to come off of that seam. And literally Deanna Navarro at the time put it into the game. He put it into the game that like three nights after I learned it, I threw a bullpen with it like one or two times. I threw it to him in a pregame. I was like, I literally said to him, I was like, like, this is before I'm pitching in a game. It was against the Rangers in 20, it was against the Rangers in 20, tore my ACL. It was against the Rangers in 2016. Um, was it 2016? Who knows when it was? It's hard to remember. <laughs> we'll have to go back about I, it. That thing. I literally learned this pitch. So I, I came in the league as a four seam guy. I didn't have a singer at all. Like when I came in the league and I had good success, I had 120 innings my first year as a rookie. I had like a three, five, three, six, I had a three, six. That was all four seam slur, not a single sinker. So I didn't pick the sinker up until I was in the big leagues. And it was so good that that became a pitch that I only threw. And I kind of, it, it was such a good pitch. I forgot about my four seam, but my four seam has elite spin, like, which I've learned to kind of get back. That's why I'm excited to add that in this year. So, um, my sinker, I literally was playing on the couch in between starts, one start. I was a four seam guy, found it. I always wanted a sinker. Literally, next day, played catch with it, threw a bullpen, had crazy action. Deanna Navarro didn't catch my bullpen, so he never saw it. So game, so the game comes up. He's catching me before the game. I literally throw on my repertoire. I'm like, dog, I'm like, I've kind of been working on this. Here's a sinker. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I, was, I literally said to him, I was like, don't. Don't call him in the game, but just so you see it. He's like, all right, throw it. Fucking threw it. Nasty. He's like, bro. Dude, first in the game, I was like, dude, let's not go. Like, I want to have a little four. Sixth inning. You can look this up. Sixth inning. Sixth inning comes. I'm, I'm, I'm pitching pretty well. Runner on second. Zero, zero game. Shin Shu Chu at the dish. This moment I will never forget. This was like the, the break out of my singer. Sin Shu Chu at the dish, 3-2 count. Deanna Navarro calls a sinker. I've never thrown a sinker. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thrown a sinker in a game. I just found the pitch, the grip, literally three days ago. Like, no joke. Found it three days ago in my hotel room. Found it. This guy, and if you look, there's video. I have video from it. I hope I can find it with you. This guy throws it down, sinker. I didn't even know the sign. He did this. I literally look. He's like, that's no sinker. I literally look. I'm like, I'm staring. I'm like, there's no way he just called this. He literally throws his hands up. He's like, throw it. He throws his hands up. Throw it. I'm like, you know what? All right. Bro, I throw this pitch. And when I tell you it started, I couldn't have thrown a more perfect first pitch sinker for time being for this is what like kind of propelled me. I got a take from Shin Shu Chu. You know, Shin Shu Chu is one of the hardest hitters to take off, to, to strike out. And to get a take on a 3 2 count, I got a take from Shin Shu Chu on a 3 2 count with a runner on second base. He didn't even argue. He put his head down and walked right back to the, <laughs> walked right back to the dugout. And I was like, oh, like inside, I was like, oh my God. I was like, I was like, we got, we got something here. <laughs> but so Deanna Navarro, man, like, 
I always tell that story because he gave me the confidence, man. He called it, literally told him not to call it in the game, not only in a game, the first time calling it, in that situation. So it's like, that propelled me, man. Like, I threw that pitch and saw the action, and I knew to get a take by Shinshu, by Shinshu Chu on a 3-2 count with a runner on, like, that action had to be crazy. And it was a pitch he completely had out of his head. So it was like, that kind of propelled me, man. And, and finding my sinker, man, I ended up throwing that pitch for the next four, four years, and I forgot about my force. <laughs> I forgot about my force. <laughs> so I'm excited, man. Um, this year, I'm going to be incorporating a four seam and a little split. So I can't wait. Yeah, I want to see that split because you and I have been working on that change up for a long time. Yeah, man, we have, but we have, man. <laughs> I was asking you for every grip of everybody. Like, how does he throw it? Does he break it down? Videos, YouTube. But Giselleman, man. So, like I said, I've always been someone who I've held the ball on the inside part of the scene. Sinker. I used to try change ups on the inside part. Giselleman throws his on the outside. So I was in, I was down there going through when I was with my calf tear. We were just like talking, going over stuff. Man, first one I threw nasty. I literally just moved my 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 ring finger from the inside of the seam to the outside on this side. So now essentially, instead of letting, instead of throwing it where it's coming off like my stinker, the one seam, I'm throwing it. At, I'm throwing it where it's coming off the outside and I'm rolling like the inside of my finger on that seam, but it gives me a grip to roll on. Whereas I felt like I was rolling away from it. Now I feel like I'm almost pulling, man, this thing when I throw it right, man. So now it's rolling off like, like, like this rather, so rather than rolling off like this, where it kind of runs from you. Now it's like pulling it down. So you always had a hard time pronating, right? So this is actually, you're doing it with your fingers instead of actually pronating through it. Because I don't think pronate, man. A lot of guys, they see my sink and they're like, oh, he probably thinks pronate. Like, I have my grip guy. I let the grip do it. Like, I don't want to think, oh, I need to get out front and turn it over. Like, I just want a grip where it feels comfortable, where I'm going to go through my mechanics, I'm going to release the ball, and it's going to do what it does. Like, I don't want to have to worry at the very end of my delivery when everything else has gone perfect. Now I got to, you know what I mean? I've never been yeah. that guy. Finding this grip, and like I said, it's going to be a big pitch for me. And, and even when it's not good, it plays as like a, a sinker almost. Like, it still, it still plays. So, so it, I, the, I, the, the analytics on it are pretty sweet. I saw it. It looked nasty. The analytics on it. I, I, I've been kind of hot. I, I, I haven't been saying it. I, I'm just excited to pitch, man. But yeah, the analytics are good, man. On my forcing too, they're good. <laughs> but that's what I'm just trying to devise a plan now. Like I'll be working with Codify this year too. So now it's just going to be a, a devising a plan of repertoire versus team versus what pitches I want to go to versus what particular hitters. Like I've never de dove into this analytical. I've always gone out there and have just pitched. I'm always a guy who's just pitched to my strengths. I don't, I've never, re I've never really game planned. I've never even really like looked at lineups or hitters like my entire career. I've always just been like, you know what? If I'm going to lose today, I'm going to lose on my strengths. Like that's how I've always been. So now I'm going to incorporate that mindset with a little bit of info and a little bit of analytical info. So I'm, I'm excited, man, of like having these glaring cold zone spots where I know I can throw because man, I could spin the ball so well and do so many different things with so many different pitches. It's going to, it's going to be like a safe zone for me. I can't wait. Yeah. It's almost like, I mean, it, it, it's amazing his stuff. Like I've talked mm -hmm. to him about it. We go back a, a good really? way during. The... Oh yeah. He's great. The, about it though, it, it's so amazing that you have MLB players, individual guys contract, like contracting him again, like not even going with the info that their teams are giving them. And this is the highest level. So you know what I mean? That has to tell you the type of information that, that he's giving you that hasn't necessarily be relayed at the big league level yet, which I'm sure big league teams are scrambling right now to, to, to put together. See, I always thought everybody had it. Like I thought the teams were spent, you know, spent so much money on y'all and then they don't spend money on that. Like they're, I don't Can understand. I be, it's actually insane, man, to be honest with you. And then it opens your eyes. It's like, obviously Houston is way ahead. Like they've always been. So it's like, how long have they been way ahead where they, they've been getting all this information that these other teams haven't been getting that almost becomes like luck of draw. What team you, what team you go to. 
And fans don't get like people don't know that people people yeah. assume everybody's equal that way, and it's just about talent instead of it's the whole organization. Like there's a lot that goes into being elite, man, and 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 information like this is game changing. Like it's hard to put into words, but like this is literally like, hey, Stro, this guy can't hit this pitch. I think you need to throw this pitch. Like you're gonna have a pretty good chance of getting him out, which I still like that doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Like anyone can say, yeah, throw a great down and away slider and you'll get him out. Like <laughs> you yeah. can throw a great down and away slider to anybody, you're going to get him out. But hey, this guy's got a cold zone on a front door slider or a front door cutter or, or out of the zone. He'll reach. He'll go out of the zone into a cold zone to, to expand. You don't got to throw it in the zone. Like there's so much other information, man. It's crazy. It blew my mind. So the stuff that it's not only it's pitcher specific, hitter specific, mm -hmm. and then whether a hitter is going to chase, as well as this new Hawkeye stuff, where he's able to tell when when people have loaded, like if they're picking yeah. you up well or not. It's mm -hmm. sick. It's crazy, man. It's yeah. It's all information that's going to be useful. But it's fair game, man. We need it. The hitters got everything on us. Like <laughs> let's go. Like you know what I mean. Like we need. Yeah, it. fuck the hitters, like, man. Ladder, the ball flies more. Like we need we need all the information we get. Like might as well level the playing field. Absolutely. So well, let's get to the slider and the cutter. Um, yeah. So slider, I throw a spike slider, man. So my slider is right here. It's almost like people throw curveballs from here. Honestly, I don't think my slider, I think curveball on my slider. Like that's so you're getting to the front of it? Like I'm throwing it like this, like kind of over it. And when I really want to make it big, I'll even think like I'm almost trying to roll it this way. Then when I want to make it smaller and shorter and harder, I'll get more fastball and just kind of get on it like this. But when if I start going like this, it starts getting slurvier and slurvier and slurvier. And then when I get on it more, it's just more, more down. When I get on it, it'll be like 87, 88, 89. Slurvy will be like 84, 85. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm like always manipulating the slider. And then that pitch I can go to anywhere. I got the most feel with this pitch. And then cutter. Cutter, I throw a little cutter too. It's like a little spike. It's almost like off my four seam. So my four seam, my four seam's here, which you I try still to have do. that finger split there. You're just yeah. touching and then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually talked to Garrett Cole at the All Star game. He helped me, man, a lot with my four seam. Um, he's got actually tiny hands. He's got smaller hands than I do. And the big thing he told me about his four seam which was great, man, because like my four seam, like I kind of lost it, I lost the feel for it. And he told me like he throws it with his fingers together. His actually stay together. Mine just naturally don't do that. So I don't try to force it, but he throws his with his fingers literally together. And he said, what he's trying to do is when he releases the ball, which I understand, and I'm trying to get to that point, this is where I'm getting pretty good. When he releases the ball, he wants to release the ball off both fingers at the same time which is hard to do because our fingers are longer. So like, it made a lot of sense to me when I was talking to him. And it also made me like play with the ball. When I, when I slightly torque the ball a little bit, when I don't hold it, when I torque it, it allows me more room to kind of really get it off both fingertips rather than it coming off one. So he told me that, man, that was like eye opening. I was like, and he had tiny hands. So I was like, he puts his hands literally together. He's got it here and he's like, Stro, you got to find it somewhere on the ball, what's comfortable for you, where you can release it so that the ball's not only coming off your middle finger on release, it's it's essentially coming off both fingers, which makes sense. You're putting more power. You're, you're getting another finger behind the ball, where, whereas you're rather than releasing it like this, you're now releasing it too. So I've been Is trying- Is it getting more spin? Yeah, man, like I'm getting more spin for sure. And I'm getting starting to get like a little like, starting to get that little, that, that, that vert, man. Like I'm trying to like, I guess, JV, I think Verlander's, I think like super elite when it comes, I think he gets to like 20. I think he gets like close to like 20 inches yep. on his man. And I've been throwing something like 18, 19. So like I said, I don't want to become a four seam. That's not me, but it's definitely a weapon, man. And I just have to, I have to learn how to use it. You know, I've talked to the driveline guys about this, but there's something to be said about a shorter pitcher throwing a, a four seam with a lot of spin, keeping it above barrels. And it's funny you said that too. Me and my trainer actually like, we've been like tinkering a little bit because I'm very firm in my backside on, on like my backside on my right leg when I pitch, like very, very 
stable and strong. And I keep a slight knee flexion, which is like the athletic position. But I've actually been talking to her recently about possibly, because I feel so strong in my legs and my single squat. I've actually talked to her about possibly, which, which hitters won't be able to tell, squatting down slightly more on my back leg when I throw a four seamer to essentially throw uphill rather than to feel like I'm throwing downhill. So it would be like a little variation. Like I said, the hitter's not gonna be able to tell, but instead of having my leg essentially where it's like this, my leg squat will bend now to where I'm actually lowering myself a bit and I'm throwing upward plane. Whereas being here, kind of throwing down my sinker, I'll be here and I'll be shoo. So, yeah. So, so I mean, so think about it, that's right. When you mm -hmm. think about what everybody's been told, taller pitchers, downward plane, but if you have a four seam and you're getting some hop on it, do you necessarily want that? Or would you want to be what you do? Right, exactly. Exactly. So I think like, I think if I can, I'm going to, I'm going to actually, it's like literally, I wrote it down. It's like an emphasis for my next uh, bullpen. But yeah, I think I could, because now if I'm on this plane and my shit comes sinker, sinker, slider. Now, if I change my plane, which they can't see from the plate, and just with that slight right, and like I said, I focus on like single leg pistol squats so much. Like, if I change this plane now to where they don't see it, but I'm changing the eye level for them, and now I'm shooting the four seamer up there. So I, I think it could be, I think it could be big, man. Well, I, and I, and I think to the folks at home. You're you work on balance. You work on all like this the the uh, the messing with timing type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean a lot of people want to do it, but you work on it. Like that's you. Yeah. Wait till you see some of the ones I got this year, man. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I got some good ones, man. Like I'm, I I I've honestly like as I get older, man. Like I'm getting more stable, so much more stable, so much more strong. So as you get more stable and more strong, it just allows you to do so much more in my delivery man like i have a few slow motion timings bro that are gonna fuck with some guys man i'm, ex I'm excited <laughs> so how do you come like do you just come up with it in your head like you're just doing this just being an athlete and coming up with different ways to screw with people do you do it on the fly sometimes you're seeing a hitter not you know timing you different ways all on the fly man all on the fly and then also sometimes just random because it never hurts so um, if I know a guy's got like a glaring leg kick or is a glaring timing guy, like I'll try to expose him, but I'll also just do it to the guy that doesn't even have a leg kick. Because like I said, n everybody wants to be in rhythm when they're hitters. So anytime I could take them slightly out of rhythm in any particular way, I'm going to do it. And like I said, this slow motion one that I have in the beginning of my leg lift, but then I have another one also too on my entry leg lifts. I think that it, this will help a lot, man, to getting guys on their front foot, like, that's all I'm trying to do, man. I want you to get on your front foot. I want to get your hands a little static. Like, I want to get you uncomfortable. So, I, and I don't understand why pitchers don't understand, like fans or pitchers or coaches don't understand that because you're hundred percent right. Hitting is a, a pitching is about upsetting the hitter's timing. You can do it through changing speeds or you can do it through changing your mechanics in the mm -hmm. middle of it so that you mess with a hitter. Why isn't that part of your arsenal? Exactly, man. And like you said, um, to be honest with you, when I was a rookie in the league, Jose Bautista, like I tell the story a lot, but he was the reason why I started my time. And my first start in the big leagues, Bautista is like on a mental wave similar to me. He's always looking at the next possible thing to increase your body, increase your mental, um, just to whatever it is to increase your quality of life. So I'm sitting in my first start in the big leagues. And Bautista, we're up like 6-1 against the Royals. Bautista comes to me, sits down to me. He's like, Stro, he's like, you're pitching pretty well. First start. He's like, you're pitching pretty well. Like, we're cruising, we're up. He's like, why don't you try to mess with timing? Why don't you try to mess with like your deliveries? Like he said to me, he goes, the only time I'm, the only time a, a pitcher can get me out or out of whack or off balance or out of rhythm is when they quick pitch, when they, when they mess with their delivery, which like Cueto would do at the time a little bit, but it was, his was more like quirky, not really like messing with timing. He was just like messing with his delivery more so. So Bautista told me that my first start and like kind of implanted that in my head. And then as time progressed, like honestly, early in my career in 2014, I wasn't stable enough. I wasn't strong enough. I couldn't, I couldn't do what I do now in my delivery. Um, but as it progressed, I would sit in the cage. I had so many, I, I'm, I'm someone who honestly, I'll go sit behind DeGrom, but I, I, I rarely pick pitchers' minds. DeGrom's a goat. I'm usually with hitters, man. I go and sit in the hitters' cage. So I would go when I was with the Blue Jays and sit in there with Tulowitzki. Donaldson, Bautista, Encarnacion, Reyes, Melky Cabrera, 
I mean, I'm missing a ton of guys, but I had some legends to talk to. And all of them, man, all of them say that timing was the biggest thing. Quick pitch. When a guy messed with his rhythm, they literally said, Stro, they're like, it don't matter what pitch comes sometimes. They're like, it could be a slider, a heater, a changeup. It could be nasty. They're like, if I'm on time and it's in the zone, I'm smashing it. Like, so that made me think, I'm like, all right. So even if I throw a six slider sometimes, like, you're still going to smash it? Like, <laughs> that made me think these are the best hitters, some are arguably the best hitters in the world that I was talking to. And that just planted that in my head. Like, why are pitchers so cookie cutter? Like, we're robots. Like, <clears throat> hit pitchers are essentially, this is, pitchers are so robots that hitters and pitchers are essentially doing a dance. Like, a, a hitter can close their eyes and know when a pitcher is going to deliver the ball. That's insane that you're on that time. Nick Castellanos came up to me after a game and said this to me. He's like, Stro, he's like, you're unreal, man. He goes, you know why you're great? He goes, every other pitcher in the league, this is what he said. He goes, every other pitcher in the league, he goes, they're their best dance partner. He's like, I'm in rhythm with them. We're moving in sync. He's like, in between pitches, they take the same amount of time. Their delivery, it's the same. He's like, it's a dance, bro. He's like, I'm in rhythm. He's like, when I'm in rhythm, I'm a, I'm a rake. He goes, you're the worst dance partner. That's what he said to me. He goes, he put, he put it perfect. He put it perfect. This is Castellanos, who's a great, one of the best hitters in the league. He goes, you are the worst dance partner. He's like, I'm so out of rhythm, and I just feel like we're not moving in sync. I said, isn't that how you're supposed to feel? He's like, yeah, but that's not how it is. He's like, hitter, he's like pitchers are robots. They, they get on the mound, they do the same thing, they throw the ball. They get on the mound, they do the same thing, they throw the ball. It's like... I, he, it's like, I could close my eyes and be in rhythm with you and be on time. He's like, that's, that's comforting. He's like, when I'm facing you, bro, that shit is not comforting. He's like, he's like, he's like, I feel like I'm doing a dance with you, bro. And we're like moving completely different ways. You're going one way. I'm going the other way. And that's what opened my mind a lot too. When he came to me and told me that I was like, wow, just the way he worded it, like being the worst dance partner, like the way he worded that was like, yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be the worst dance partner with you. <laughs> Go back because there are tweets where I actually said that I said, be a bad dance partner. Yeah, that was yeah. exactly it. But most pitchers are like, because it's preached from a young age, you got to get on the mound and do the same thing. You got to have the same mechanics. You got to have the same fluidity. You got to have the same thing. It's like, we're almost, we're almost, we're, 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 we're creatures of habit. And, and the habit that we're creating is not a good one that's going to help us get out. You know what I mean? It's actually working against us. Like, because then essentially what you're doing is saying that you need to outstuff the guy. So then it's it's your stuff needs to outstuff the best. And essentially, you're not going to throw a perfect low, perfectly located pitch every single time. That's just not that's just not ideal. So what I tell guys is like, why not give yourself more room for error? That's what I tell people. I'm like, I'm giving myself more room for error. Sometimes when I do my timing, I throw that shit right down the middle. I tell people I don't even try to locate it. I know that his front foot, I know that he's on his front foot. I know his timing's off. I know it's probably going to be a bad swing. I'll throw it right down the middle. I'll throw my sinker middle, middle. I'll throw whatever middle, middle, because I know that you're not in rhythm. Your foot's not down on time. Your hand's pumped maybe four times instead of three times like you're used to. So I'm okay. I'm okay with throwing a pitch like that when you're like that. You know what it reminds me of? You remember the, the, the Revolutionary War where you have the British lined up in a row and they're fighting like this and then the yeah. Americans are like hiding behind trees and yeah. stuff. Like, like stage. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. what's wrong with that? Like, in the NFL, quarterbacks don't sit there and do the same thing every time because they got someone coming at them and they're on target. So you can do exactly. it. Exactly, man. 100%. Like, I think as it starts to get a whole, hopefully that incorporates more I hope pitchers start to incorporate more of the weight room and stability and focusing on core because they don't understand how much that helps them in the long run in their delivery. Like, yeah, everyone wants to go work on pitches, but at the end of the day, you can't working on too much pitching works against you reps and arm. Like you only get so many bullets, you know what I mean? In your arms. So you want to save those for the game. Truly. That's another conversation I used to have a price about. Like you want to save your body and as much bullets as possible. Yeah. It's great to go throw 30 sliders in a bullpen, but you're probably setting the longevity of your career back a few starts. So um, I put a priority on my body, man. Priority on body, shoulder, mind always. And then, like I said, everything comes after that.
Well, I haven't seen any of your balancing this year where you're like walking on your hands and putting a wine glass on your back Ooh, and been, shit like that. I'm ready. I've just been kind of, I've just been kind of chilling. I've just haven't been posting, you know, I just, I, I just want to like really show it on the field this year, man. I'm excited. So I'm excited here. Well, I'm excited to to watch you this season. I'm excited for the Mets. Eh? Let, let, let's go Mets. How about that? Let, let's fucking crush it. Let's fucking go Mets. <laughs> Can't wait. It's going to be exciting times in Queens, man, for sure. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you, it's a Friday night. I mean, you got to grab some wine, hang out, chill, yep. right? Bottle of red wine, man, for sure. That's the first thing I'm doing when I go from here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. And it, this was awesome. Let's, let's do it again. Hopefully maybe during the season, you're going to you know, throw no hitter and we'll, uh, you throw no hitter and we're doing this. I got you, man. Honestly, man, I talk to no media during the year, but I will talk to you whenever you want, man. Like I'm only talking to media post game at my locker. So anytime you want to get together and do something, we can do it. Cause I know a lot of people always want to hear me speak on this on um, platforms like this. And like I said, I, I'm not giving, I'm not giving media a, any of that. So I would love to, we can, we can get on here and do it. Dude, you're an inspiration to a lot of people and I love it. Absolutely. Great to catch up with you. Ha hey, always have a good Oop, I didn't hear that one. I said, thank you for always being in my corner, man. I appreciate you. Dude. Always.